One popular view of the civil rights movement holds that it was born in Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her seat to a white passenger on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. A lesser-known explanation holds that the civil rights movement really gained its impetus earlier in 1955 from the death of a Chicago boy. Dr. Clonora Hudson of Prairie View University in Texas presents that view this afternoon. She is lecturing at the University of Utah's Observance of Black Awareness Week. Dr. Hudson, welcome. Thank you. Who was this young man in Chicago? Uh, Emmett Lewis Peel. He was the 14-year-old black Chicago youth, and he had gone to Mississippi for a week, about a week, to visit his great-uncle, Mose Wright, and to spend some time with his cousin. And what happened? Uh, he whistled at a white woman. Uh, some say allegedly, but all of my sources point to the fact that he did, in fact, whistle. Uh, but, of course, what Emmett was doing was what most uh, youth do. He was going to the rites of passage. Mm -hmm. He was simply being mischievous, you know. Uh, and, of course, also we have to realize that uh, Emmett was not from Mississippi. He was not a Southerner. So he did not really understand so Southern, Southern etiquette. Were very, very right, different. Right, very different. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, of course, uh, about three days after he whistled, uh, he was abducted from his uncle's home at 2.30 a.m., gunpoint. And, of course, when they found him the next day, he had been lynched shot in the head. Um, uh, he had a hole in his head big enough for your fist. He had a 70-pound cotton gin fan tied around his neck with barbed wire. His tongue was protruding. One of his eyes was completely goist out. Uh, I look at that as being symbolic of ocular, getting rid of that instrument of ocular rape. Mm -hmm. And then how did that lead to what you believe to be the beginning, the galvanization of the civil rights movement? Yeah. Well, actually, when Emmett was lynched, I mean, the, this actually depicts the ugliness of American racism. And it happened three months and three uh, days before Rosa Parks took her historic, so very uh, symbolic, uh, you know, move to receive to surrender her seat to a white man in Montgomery. But actually, when you really think about it, and of course I've interviewed a lot of people, pressed in the minds of the Alabamians was, was of course the image of Emmett Till that was in, uh, indelibly etched in American culture. Uh, and people could not forget that. After they, uh, went through that they were ready really to do almost anything because then of course this, this whole race of people knew that they couldn't even protect their kids that received widespread news coverage at the time not it? yes it did uh international coverage as well as national coverage and what was the reaction in chicago in his own community well it was people just felt outraged at the whole thing they um shipped the body back of course they had to force be forced to relinquish the body they were about to bury in the till in mississippi without his mother and uh, Raphael Moody, who was the chief informant, my chief informant, he was a labor union leader and also a civil rights activist. Uh, with his contact as a labor union leader and also as a civil rights activist with uh, politicians and others, uh, they were able to uh, force uh, the state to relinquish the body. And of course, when it arrived uh, to Chicago, there were a lot of supporters there at the train station with Mamie to share with her tragic loss. They had a funeral uh, there, and it happened uh, that the body got there for the weekend uh, before Labor Day. So it was a Labor Day weekend, long spread of three or four days. There were over 600,000 people uh, who had come there. Many, of course, were from Chicago. Others had come from other areas uh, to actually witness this atrocity. So 600,000 people turned out. We have just about a half a minute. Explain to me why many historians have overlooked or at least buried that incident in the analysis of the civil rights development. Well, my uh, conjecture, of course, is that uh, Emmett Till, because it reveals the ugliness of race American racism, that historians and America basically does not really, for some reason, care to remember the ugliness. They would rather deal with something that's more pal palatable. And that, of course, is uh, the Rosa Parks incident. Uh, it's, it's a lot more palpable than uh, the bloated face of Emmett Till. It's a reminder of how vicious uh, racism can be. But of course, it became the uh, vehicle that uh, blacks used to express or to channel their disenchantment and, uh, and, and impatience with the way uh, race relations were. A compelling part of our national story. You're lecturing this afternoon at four yes, at the Social Science Building Auditorium at the University of Utah. Right. On Emmett Till, on Emmett Till the impetus for the civil rights movement. Dr. Hudson, thank you. Thank you. And Midday returns to welcome the Chinese New Year after these announcements. I'm Tony Brown. Did history miss Emmett Till? The gruesome 1955 lynching of Emmett Till in Money, Mississippi is, in the minds of many, the quintessential modern lynching in America. It has also been broadly assumed that Rosa Parks' refusal to surrender her seat on a bus 
in Montgomery, Alabama on December 1, 1955, precipitated the modern civil rights movement. However, this assumption is now being challenged by a college professor who concludes that it was Till's lynching, not Parks' refusal, that was the catalyst of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. This is the muddy backwoods Tallahatchie River where a weighted body was found, alleged to be that of young Emmett Till. I saw a hole, which I presumed was a bullet hole, and I could look through that hole and see daylight on the other side. And I wondered, was it necessary to shoot it? Here is Money, Mississippi, the home of Roy Bryant. It was here that the Chicago Negro boy, Emmett Till, is alleged to have paid unwelcome attention to Roy Bryant's most attractive wife. When white women was on the streets, you had to get off of the street. That was a way of life. And all a white woman would have to say was, that nigger kind of looked at me, assessed me. So we're talking about a way of life that uh, in this part of the country that was enforced by law. This was the home of Mose Wright. It was from this shack, the state alleges Emma Till was taken by Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam. The house was a dark, as a thousand midnights you couldn't see. It was like a nightmare. I mean, it's, I mean someone come and stand over you with a pistol in one hand, a flashlight, and you're 16 years old. Uh, this is a terrifying experience. The Till case held the whole system up for inspection by the rest of the country and by the rest of the world. It was the beginning of the focusing on the problems uh, between the races in the Deep South that culminated in the ultimate uh, civil rights battles of the, of, of the rest of the 50s and, and, and into the 60s. I think black people's reaction was so visceral, and I think it was probably more than anything else in terms of the mass civil rights movement, the spark that, that launched it. Everybody knew we were under attack, and that attack was symbolized by the attack on a 14-year-old boy. Dr. Clonora Hudson Weems is the author of Emmett Till, The Sacrificial Lamb of the Civil Rights Movement. Professor, welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, looking at that, that certainly uh, evokes memories for me. I remember in my generation, I was a young boy, but I remember the Jet Magazine pictures of uh, his funeral back in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I don't think there was a, a, a dry eye among, among fair-minded people in this country, especially black people, uh, exactly. after, after that happened. Mm -hmm. What uh, got you on the, the road to writing uh, such a, uh, a, a book about such a, a powerful, and I might say a very yeah. brutal, right. brutal episode? Well, actually, uh, when I was at Delaware State University, I was the director of black studies there and had brought in a mother uh, of one of the kids who was killed in uh, Atlanta. Uh, and just hearing her story and thinking for a moment my daughter was missing was so, you know, painful that right away I flashed back on Emmett Till that I thought I had put to rest as everybody else. This was in 1985, and I went to uh, do my... my um, doctorate at the University of Iowa, PhD, and had decided early on that I was going to continue to write on black women writers, having gotten a contract to co-author the first book on Toni Morrison. However, after that experience uh, in Delaware, I decided I just couldn't ignore Emmett Till. And so um, I went to my doctoral dis dissertation committee and told them that I wanted to write on Emmett Till and as the catalyst of the civil rights movement. That was the title of my 1988 Ford doctoral dissertation, Emmett Till, the Catalyst of the Modern Civil Rights Movement. Nobody wanted to hear it. They said it has already been established 
that the beginning of the civil rights movement was Rosa Parks' refusal to relinquish her seat. I said, but you know, this is not to take away from her heroic act. I really do think, and I, I, I know to be true, that Emmett Till was behind that, even well, King. Wh what, is, what, what, what has convinced you, uh, uh, and w what is the evidence that, well, uh, uh, that uh, Emmett Till's lynching mm -hmm. uh, precipitated mm -hmm. the modern civil rights movement? Well, to begin with, Emmett Till's lynching occurred three months and three days prior to. I established that in my decision. Prior to? Uh, uh, Rosa Parks' refusal to relinquish her seat. Which was on December, December 1st, 1st, 1955. Mm -hmm. Emmett was lynched uh, August the 28th, 1955, three months and three days prior to. Even in King's book, Stride Towards the Freedom, and I talked about that in the first chapter of the book, he said that pressed in the minds of the Alabamians was the image of Emmett Till. Nobody forgot that. And when I began to interview people prior to uh, coming to D.C., I spoke at the National Ford Foundation Conference in uh, 1987, uh, the opening plenary in, in August, no, it was October of that year, on Emmett Till. And after I finished, people came there uh, to talk to me and sort of like bear their souls out without my asking them to uh, attest to Emmett Till as the inception of their politicalization. Everybody I interviewed, I interviewed people of all walks of life, attorneys, people like, uh, for example, Mayor Hatcher of Gary, Indiana. Now, was this in the North? All over. I went mm -hmm. down in Mississippi. In fact, Al Chambliss, who is, uh, was the lead uh, counsel in the Ayers versus Fortis case, uh, he met me, uh, went into Memphis, which is where my, my home actually, and um, he uh, took me down to Mississippi to make sure that I would be safe. As he said, I've been working in the trenches for years, mm -hmm. and so I'm okay. I'll take you down there and let you go to the courthouse. I'll take you there mm -hmm. and let you do all your research. And when I went there, this must have been um, 1986. Nobody wanted to hear it. Just like my dissertation committee didn't want to hear it, they said, why don't you call it a very significant factor in the rise of the civil rights movement? I said, but it's far more than that. It is the impetus. And they, everybody got upset with that. And in fact, C. Eric Lincoln, professor emeritus at Duke University, when he reviewed the book, uh, he made the statement that I had challenged the most sacred shibboleths well, 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 of the well, origins I, I, of the I movement. still would like, well, what evidence, uh, what, what is it that you can offer other than you believe this, oh, that that would help the convince people? The interviews with people. Mm -hmm. I talked to attorneys. Yeah, but what did they say? They all said that that, Im that uh, Emmett Till lynching was mm. what started for them. In fact, I interviewed uh, uh, Joyce Latner. Mean th that got them involved? Got them and started, got them started. Mm -hmm. Joyce Latner, and I have a whole section in the book, the back is the appendix, and they have full testimonies uh, uh, with people like uh, Malefia Sante, you know, grassroots people as well as academics and uh, politicians and attorneys would always say that, you know, when that, kid, when that kid was lynched, it was never the same for me. And I decided, Joyce Ladner said, that's what started me and made me decide well, now, to be with, an investigator. With, without a doubt, it connected northern blacks for the first time yes. to southern blacks. Yes. There had been uh, kind of an intellectual, yes, we're black and we used to live in the south and mama and the boys still live in the south. Right. But the Emmett <coughs> Hill case was more visceral in mm -hmm. its connectivity mm -hmm. with northern blacks and southern blacks. Yes. It, it, is that your, is that yeah, your opinion? Yeah, I, I think that actually, I think with Emmett Till, people realized that we were actually all on the same page. It's just that northerners had a false sense of security. Emmett was a youth, a young boy who went to Mississippi and whistled at a white woman, never imagining that that, the, that was the ultimate. Oh, the reckless eyeballing. Reckless right. eyeballing, right. Mm -hmm. He never imagined that what could happen to him would happen following that type of naive act. He whistled, and so what? He was going through the rites of passage of any boy. Being mannish is what he probably thought that was gonna be the extent now, did of it. He actually, <coughs> uh, uh, did he actually whistle? He did. I interviewed, uh, well, first of all, my chief informant was Raphael Moody, who was the second cousin uh, of Emmett Till's through marriage. He was the one who advised, uh, and you see him on all the photographs, Mamie all the way through. When I interviewed Mamie, uh, Emmett's mother, Mamie Till, she said that uh, Raphael was the one who told her everything to do. You know, I mean, she was distraught, 33 years old, lost her only child. Raphael was a civil rights uh, lead, uh, activist, rather, and a labor union leader with A. Philip Randolph. 
And, and when I went to talk to him about this whole Emmett Till thing, I mean, I couldn't believe the information he had in his basement. It was like a private museum, and I was overwhelmed because I told him that I had uh, come to interview him uh, because I wanted to look at Emmett Till since it happened before his lynching, before Rosa Parks' refusal, as the impetus. And I had a whole chapter in my dissertation that was going to be dedicated to Emmett Till, the lost chapter in the historic account of the Civil Rights Movement. And he laughed, and he said, you know, when I say laugh, chuckle, he said, Emmett ain't no chapter, ma'am. Emmett's a book mm -hmm. all by itself. And I'm walking out saying to myself, to the next room, yeah, I know Emmett's a chapter. But when I finished with him from about 10 that morning to midnight, as I walked uh, toward the door, I looked back and said, Mr. Moody, by the way, Emmett is a book. What, what, <coughs> what, what, what did he say or what did you learn uh, that moved you from chapter to book? Well, it was all the massive information about Emmett and how he had indelibly impacted on all of society. I mean, people and things that happened, everything. It was just massive that uh, this boy's lynching had influenced so many people. He showed me, uh, for example, photographs and showed me uh, flyers and pictures that this had, you know, and, 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 and stories about this as being a car celebre. I said, my God, I said, at that time, and I was just 10, I said, it was more than just me wanting to sleep every time I thought about Emmett Till. I just wanted to sleep because it, I tried to escape it. It was people who were consciously dealing with this every day. You know, and I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. All the flyers, all of the articles in Jet Magazine and, and uh, you know, all the newspapers uh, that were talking about the lynching of this boy. And, and I realized that it was a huge case. I remember as a young boy, uh, and it's the only cover of Jet Magazine mm. that I remember mm -hmm. of the picture of Emmett Till in his coffin. The bloated face of Emmett. The bloated face back right, in yeah. Chicago right. where they held his funeral. Right. Right. And uh, w we all read and or discuss mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the vicious, vicious form right. that this lynching took. Right. And I, I just, I was a young, young right. boy and I just, I was overwhelmed. Right. And talking to Mr. Moody, I mean, I couldn't believe it. He was telling me how this boy had gone down there and hit whistled. I interviewed Emmett's cousins mm -hmm. too, uh, Simeon uh, Wright, whose home Emmett was visiting. He was 12 at the time. And I interviewed also uh, Emmett's uh, Chicago, where he's from actually Argo, Illinois, and that was Willa Parker. Mm -hmm. And they talked about this whole thing and how it happened. They were all there and he whistled. That was What cool. happened uh, at, at, uh, as a result uh, at the, the trial and so forth? Well, uh, they uh, tried to, first of all, suggest that maybe this was not the body of Emmett Till, and yet he had a ring but on. But two men went on trial. Oh, yes. And it was a mock trial. What happened? They were found not guilty. And but after didn't they admit? Only afterwards. afterwards. At that time, they said that they, they took the boy, and they asked the boy some questions, and they let him go. Mm -hmm. That's not true. When they came there at 2.30 in the morning, and I talked to the, uh, the, the cousins, uh, and they uh, took that boy out, and he said, okay, yeah. They said, are you the boy from Chicago? And he said, yes. And they said, you say yes to me one more time, boy. We're white. You're dead. And I'm sure as uh, creatures of habit, he probably made a mistake and said yes or no over the night, not realizing that in the Deep South, you don't say you know, yes and no to now whites. it's important for people to remember mm -hmm. that this, he was 14 years old. 14. And he lived in Chicago. Right. And he had never lived in a segregated society. Not. And so to him, things like that were not, they didn't carry the same type of no. threat that right. it did to the blacks who lived there all their lives right. exactly. and knew that things like that could happen to you right, if right. you said innocent things. Right, right. Even the uh, young lady, when, when Emmett whistled and they fled because uh, Carolyn Bryant, who the 21-year-old woman he whistled at, uh, she ran out behind them, the door that was at the uh, grocery store, Bryant's grocery store, and they jumped in the car and fled. And when they made the first stop, they were talking to this lady, Darlene, I believe it was her name. She was about 12, and she says, boy, they're going to kill you for that. Mm. You know, and, you know, it, it didn't really hit him. And then after a while, it, it, it sunk in that he really had created the ultimate uh, taboo, let and me, he begged for his, uh, his... Let me, for the, uh, uh, the viewers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, introduce a piece of film. And by the way, this film comes from a documentary, The Murder of Emmett Till, that was broadcast on PBS at the beginning of... Uh, 2003 and it's produced by the American Experience at WGBH uh, and produced and directed by Stanley Nelson. Let's look at a clip to get some of the background on what was going on at that time in the Mississippi of the 50s. 
we never have any trouble until some of our southern niggers go up north and the NAACP talks to them and they come back home. If they will keep their nose and mouths out of our business, we'll be able to do more if we enforce in the laws of Tallahatchie County and Mississippi. In the Emmett Till murder trial, the all-white jury has acquitted the two white defendants accused of killing the 14-year-old Negro youth. The jury foreman said the deciding factor was the state's failure to prove the identity of the body pulled from a river near Sumner, Mississippi. After the trial, Sheriff Clarence Strider told reporters, I hope the Chicago niggers and the NAACP are satisfied. People are used to doing things normal around here. <laughs> and they just tried to run the thing. They thought they could run over the judge and the sheriff and everybody over there. They thought that they you know, could just take over, but they didn't. Protected from further prosecution, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam sold their story to a reporter from Look Magazine for $4,000. Their account appeared just four months after the acquittal. We took them and we was just going to whip them, scare some sense into them. Back of the house is a tool shed, two rooms about 12 feet square. We walked them in there and took turns smashing them across the head with the 45. First my brother and then me. We put them back in the truck. We knew what we were going to do. There's a spot about a mile and a half from the bridge where the banks are steep. It was just a spot. I held up the gun. I fired, and the Chicago boy twisted around and caught it right in the ear. We tied the gin fan to his neck with barbed wire and rolled his body into 20 feet of muddy water. Three hours that morning, we had a big old fire in the yard. Damn, if that nigger didn't have crepe sole shoes. You know how hard they are to burn? Mamie Till went to Washington to press the federal government to reopen the case. Despite thousands of letters protesting Mississippi's handling of the murder, President Dwight Eisenhower and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover ruled out a federal investigation. Eisenhower didn't even answer Mamie Till's telegram. No one ever did time for the killing of the 14-year-old black boy from Chicago. What, uh, what lesson, what lesson is there in this for all of us? It's, I was looking at that and thinking of today's Mississippi. There's some real fine people yeah. mm -hmm. in Mississippi today. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are some people who live in the deep parts of the South uh, who are white, who have grown yes. a lot more than mm -hmm. some white people have grown in areas that weren't so racially right, right. prejudiced. What, what lesson is there here in, for America in this? Well, I've been working on this case for 17 and a half years now. I've interviewed blacks and whites, <clears throat> and I can tell you it has two distinct uh, lessons for two distinct audiences. Uh, when I spoke at the University of Utah back in the late 80s, uh, one of the uh, reporters asked me that question, why Emmett Till today? That was a long time ago. I said, first of all, it, it, lets, it, it tries to warn blacks not to, uh, to have this false sense of security, thinking that the past is the past. Uh, as um, Malcolm X said, a people who does not know his past is bound to repeat his mistakes. We need to know the truth about uh, our civil rights movement, to know the true um, impetus for that movement and to let you know that you can't just ignore the fact that it could happen again. You just can't close you your eyes to it. It happened a few years ago in Jasper, Texas. A absolutely, and it's happened uh, recently, more recently in Columbia, Missouri. And I said at the same time, it, t it, it shows whites that, that this, this uh, um, I don't like blacks, this prejudice, this racism is not a benign phenomena. It is life-threatening. It is so ugly 
uh, the true ugliness of American racism that society did not want to look at, which is why they accepted Rosa Parks' refusal, because it was far more palatable than the bloated face of Emmett Till. But the fact of ignoring and refusing to acknowledge the true ugliness, as Moody said, historians will talk about the good and the bad, but they won't deal with the ugly. We've got to look at the ugly, and it tells them that racism is life-threatening. Well, it's you not know benign. what? Uh, I was struck by an, an, another anomaly as I was watching that footage, uh, and it's an excellent piece uh, that, that, uh, that uh, Emmett Till a uh, murder, too. I was thinking about how natural mm -hmm. and how benign mm -hmm. racism and hatred Mm -hmm. were. Mm -hmm. In other words, there was mm -hmm. nothing abnormal in their environment, mm -hmm. thinking the way they thought. Mm -hmm. Just taking, quote, uh, uh, the black boy from Chicago mm -hmm. out to kill him mm -hmm. was like going to the movies. Yeah. Well, and yeah. not being afraid anything would happen to them. Right. Well, see, that is, is the thing is, and this is what is so important, you know, when you have that uh, unlimited power, white power, you would, you would do anything knowing that you have a perfect scapegoat and you're going to be protected. That's what happened with Emmett Till. I remember in January of 1990 uh, when the white guy from Boston killed his pregnant wife so that he can collect insurance money. The same, he knew he had a perfect scapegoat. A black man did it. No, he they made that story up. He made it up, and they went in the wrong direction looking and for that. And later he confessed, yes. didn't he? Yes, and the same thing happened with the girl, the woman down in Mississippi, I'm, I'm sorry, South Carolina. Who drowned her three children. Drowned the two little boys, mm -hmm. uh, Smith. And she said, a black man with a skull cap took my babies, you know, because she knew she had the perfect, perfect scapegoat. And I'm saying that this unleashed power, white power, is dangerous even to the perpetrators, because it gives you too much security. And I don't think either one of those persons would have done it had they known that they couldn't have gotten away with it. Well, they didn't get away with uh, it. They, it tried. <laughs> you know, I'm saying they wouldn't have even I, I, done well, no, it. No, I'd like to put a pin in that. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they didn't get away with it, mm -hmm. maybe that means that some things have improved. That's, oh, that's exactly yeah, the case. Yeah, because there was a time when mm -hmm. there would have been no doubt. And people question it, <laughs> right, right. But I'm saying that that's a lesson. The fact that you, you have to realize that this ugliness is something that is not going to just roll over. You know, somebody is going to tell, maybe even from your community, the outsiders will say something that will bring light to it. And so those are the lessons. We, and, and another thing, uh, I just finished uh, the feature film uh, that is on Emmett Till and Beyond, and one of the persons I focus on, in addition to dealing with Emmett's uh, heroic uh, posture, as the catalyst, you know, the, the, the uh, murder is a catalyst, that Mr. Uh, uh, Attorney John Whitton Jr., and I interviewed him and kept in communication with him up until his death, was a 34-year-old uh, attorney from that area, Money, Mississippi, who gave the closing remarks at the trial and said, every Anglo-Saxon one of you has the courage to free these men. And when Al Chambliss, Attorney Chambliss, took me down there to meet him, and I asked him, and he, he made that statement that, uh, he always knew from the beginning they were either involved or indirectly involved. When I called him 11 years later in January of 1998 um, and asked him again, how did he feel about Emmett Till? And he, he, there was a silence and he said, misery, misery. I've always felt nothing but misery from the very beginning. You're not always committed to what you do. Sometimes you do what you do to earn a living. And I did what I did to earn a now living. He was, the he was a white attorney. He was 34. Hmm. And I realized that he did the um, human element thing of doing what he thought so, so you, could you keep, he could keep his job. You feel that he was s sorry that he had to. He was very remorseful. Mm -hmm. He said, I was right at, the, right at his bedside before he died in, in February, and he, uh, the three days before he died, but he made the statement. And I knew that ever since uh, that he spent a lifetime atoning for that deed. If there's a black in Mississippi who could not defend themselves legally, didn't have the money, he did it pro bono. Mm. And that is what we do. We get redeemed by doing good. And Mr. Whitten tried to atone for the role that he played in the Emmett Till trial. And so there's a lesson for whites to see that, yes, we make mistakes. You've made a mistake. How do you feel about it? Are you remorseful? He was very remorseful of that act. And that's a part of the movie to deal with that, too. I want the whole story. I want to deal with the uh, victims, blacks. And I want to deal with the perpetrators and see if there's been any growth in there. And certainly in dealing with, uh, with this whole, story. it's a human story. Because, I like to, yeah. we're out of time. Mm -hmm. That's a human story too. Right. <laughs> I'd right. like to thank you very much for being with me. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Tony Brown Productions produces this program and is solely responsible for its content. Tonight, Mid-Missourians will have an opportunity to take a look at the roots of the Civil Rights Movement. New Center 8's Carrie Klein tells us it begins not in Selma, Alabama, but with the death of a young boy and the acquittal of his white murderers. And the pictures you're about to see are graphic. God have mercy. Pitiful. Matthew, did you hear about that child? They say that's all they're talking about from Chicago to New Orleans. And they did him worse than they would do a dog, just because he whistled at a white woman. It was 1955, and 14-year-old Emmett Till was visiting his cousins in Money, Mississippi. Till was from an affluent Chicago family. He radiated confidence and pride, traits hated by most whites in 1955, Mississippi. One afternoon, as he left the country store, Till violated the greatest taboo of the time. He whistled at a white woman. For this act, the woman's husband and another man kidnapped, lynched, beat, and mutilated Till, and then shot him in the head. After Till's executioners finished slaughtering his body, they then tied a 70-pound cotton gin fan around his neck. Now, that's about double the weight that I'm barely holding right here. Now, as a final act, they threw Till's body into the Tallahatchie River, hoping that the waters would cover up their secret forever. Miraculously, Till's body surfaced three days later. The executioners were caught, and the first lynching trial in Mississippi took place. A jury returned the not guilty verdict in just one hour. Hour, and while the trial is long since passed, the image and implications live on. Tonight, author Clonora Hudson Weems aims to resurrect the memories as scholars and historians debate the case. Perhaps this thorough and moving depiction of America's ugly past may sensitize enough of us to actively work towards avoiding a potentially ugly American future. Carrie Klein, New Center. Well, while Missouri politicians debate issues of today, an Emmy professor debates issues of yesterday. For almost 40 years, the story of the murder of Emmett Till was kept quiet, but now scholars debate the case as the main igniter of the civil rights movement. We warn you, some of what you're about to see may be graphic. giant of black people. Last night, Clonora Hudson Weems, author of a new book on the Till case, hosted a civil rights forum. Scholars and attorneys gathered from across the country to debate the case, hoping to resurrect the memories and ignite change. We won't make this book continue to tell their stories and call for change in hopes that Till's death will not be in vain. Perhaps this thorough and moving depiction of America's ugly past may sensitize enough of us to actively work towards avoiding a potentially ugly American future. Carrie Klein, Center 8.